Good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Beyond Gatsby, the fabled gardens of Long Island's Gold Coast um, with our speaker here, Cece Haydock. This program is presented by the Heckscher Museum of Art and is part of this year's Virtual Art in Bloom series. We're thrilled to provide programming that covers a diverse range of topics, including floral design, gardening, art and architecture, um, all coinciding with our upcoming Art and Bloom program this June. Thank you to our Art and Bloom sponsors, Robin T. Hadley, Natalia and Paul Lamb, and Patricia P. Sands. And thank you to our participating garden clubs this year, North Country Garden Club, North Suffolk Garden Club, Southside Garden Club, and Three Harbors Garden Club. Last but not least, thank you to you, our attendees, um, for joining us tonight and for your generous and ongoing support of the museum. We appreciate you attending programs like these. I'm Caitlin Scher, Development Manager at the museum, and I'll be your host for this evening. Joining me on screen is landscaped architect and lecturer Cece Haydock. Cece Haydock is a graduate of Princeton University and the SUNY School of Environmental Science and Forestry, where she received a master's degree in landscape architecture. After working for the New York City Parks Department, she joined the firm Innocenti and Webble in Locust Valley before starting her own practice. In 2007, Cece completed research as a visiting scholar at the American Academy in Rome on Edith Wharton and Italian villas. She has lectured and written on historic French, Italian, and American gardens for organizations including Maryland's Ladu Tofieri Gardens, the Decorative Arts Society, Princeton University, and numerous other garden and horticultural clubs. That's a mouthful. Uh, she's a trustee of Planting Fields Arboretum, a member of the International Council of the Preservation Society of Newport County, and a visiting lecturer at the New York Botanical Garden. At the end of this presentation, CC will be responding to some of your questions, so please feel free to type them into the Q&A box or the chat at any time during our presentation. Without any further ado, I'll now hand the program over to CC. CC, are you able to share your screen with us? I, I am. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and I am delighted to be speaking as part of the Heckscher Museums program. And I thank all of the sponsors as well, because without you, there would be no presentation and um, the support of the museum is so important, uh, a, a local museum and all it has to offer the community. And I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, the gardens of Long Island's Gold Coast. And there are so many of you in the audience who I suspect know some and maybe all of these um, great estates because we are right, and I'm in Locust Valley, um, New York, we are right smack in the middle of Long Island's Gold Coast. So here's a, a, a map of probably about 1920s when uh, the, these great houses were built. And this is the area that we're going to look at today. The North Shore of Long Island extends from approximately Great Neck to Huntington and south to Old Westbury. In the latter half of the 19th century, great fortunes were made in steel, transportation, and other industries. And that fact, along with a burgeoning architectural um, movement called the Beaux-Arts, produced almost 500 estates of the summer estates, or, or I should say not just summer, but um, uh, second homes for so many of the wealthy industrialists and um, uh, 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 transportation um, heads and with their architects, and you see some of the, 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 the trainees in this slide, produced these great houses. The coming out um, party, if you will, of the Beaux-Arts style was in 1893 in Chicago, the Chicago World's Fair. And there was the confluence of 
different design styles that made this a, uh, a marked style that was recognized by not only the architects who, who were trained at the Beaux-Arts, but also their clients. And some of these aspects are uh, the symmetry of vistas, the symmetrical vistas, so everything was online, eye-catching monuments, axial avenues, and, and uniform cornice heights, that is buildings that had somewhat the same height uh, below the roof line. So we've, we've seen the two major influences of what produced these great houses. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what these houses are, what this style is. The architectural style included English Tudor, French Chateau, Georgian, Gothic, Mediterranean, Norman, Roman, and Spanish. So a, a great deal of variety, but the one, uh, the, one of the main important parts was the not only um, interconnection between the house and the landscape, but in many cases, a symmetrical and a, a axial um, relationship that went actually through the house as in this slide and from the outside to the inside. They, these great estates included outdoor structures, um, which were dismantled from Europe and brought over to be assembled on the site of the estates. And beside the great houses, there were formal gardens, gazebos, greenhouses, stables, everything that was needed for a gentle, gentleman and gentlewoman's estate. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about, well, what does F. Scott Fitzgerald and the novel, The Great Gatsby have to do with this talk tonight? In fact, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote his novel, The Great Gatsby in Great Neck in this very handsome, but, but by the uh, uh, size of the, of the times, it was not a, not a huge house. And he went to the parties and took note of the different characters and in his novel created fictitious individuals who he pulled from the different personalities and characters of the people that he socialized with. For instance, Tom and Daisy Buchanan's house, which is um, this, sli this slide is taken from the most recent Great Gatsby movie, Baz Luhrmann's, who, who really put a real Hollywood twist to the novel. And um, uh, Fitzgerald described this house, and I quote, a cheerful red and white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay with a sunken garden and a half acre of roses. Now, I, as I mentioned, I live in Locust Valley and there's a house not too far from me, which I took a photograph on a gray day on the upper right corner. And you can see that it, it has many of the characteristics of this house, which Fitzgerald describes in his novel. It's not exact, but it has many, many of the ideas. Jay Gadsby's house was a quite different affair, much, much more showy. And from the novel, The Great Gadsby, and I'm quoting, um, Fitzgerald writes, it was a colossal affair a factual imitation of some Hotel de Ville in Normandy with a tower on one side spanking new under a thin bank of raw ivy and a marble swimming pool and more than 40 acres of formal lawn and garden. This is a house that is often referred to as the Gadsby House, but don't ever be caught saying that to a serious historian. Um, and there, there are many, um, not many, there, there, are, there are several really well um, uh, researched um, experts on the Gold Coast mansions of Long Island. And they will all tell you that Gadsby's house is an amalgamation of different houses. But often this house, Alva Belmont Vanderbilt's house, is often thought to be um, one of the influences of Gadsby's house. And there's the Boz Lerman house on the upper right. The first, so that gives you a little background of, of the, the, the um, uh, relationship between the novel, The Great Gadsby and the houses we'll look at today. So that, that, that uh, Fitzgerald took these houses that he visited 
And, and he blended them into not only um, his architectural descriptions, but also the activities of the individuals. Our first house, Old Westbury Gardens or Westbury House, is, uh, was a house that was built by John Phipps. John Phipps's father was the partner of Andrew Carnegie. And the house was built in the early 1900s in a very um, English, English style. Um, Margarita Grace, John, John Phipps's wife, was an English woman and she wanted a, uh, excuse me, she, had, she was very interested in English gardens and she wanted an English garden and a, a wall garden as well that she could um, have a, a very serious horticulture collection. This is some of the elements that are, have been taken not only from houses in England, but also sphinxes, which are of course um, examples of classic, classical Egypt. And these are elements, this type of element is incorporated into so many of the Long Island houses to give it this sense of age and, and uh, gravitas. This is a side view of the house looking out at the duck pond. Beyond that, a reflecting pool and a group of columns that are connected um, at the top. And this is a view looking now up at the house from this pool. And it reminds me of the Getty Villa, which was built um, a little later in the uh, uh, 20th century by John Paul Getty. And what he was trying to do in California was to create a replica of a Roman villa. And you can see the lines are very similar, this, this long um, uh, rectilinear shape with the curves at either end. The wall garden that Margarita Grace wanted is really a, a showstopper. And um, starting now, and probably several weeks ago, um, you begin to see the incredible horticulture display that the staff at, at Old Westbury Gardens produces. And the, uh, John Phipps left a great endowment so that the garden is able to continue maintenance, as we all know, is such a huge part of uh, maintaining our own houses. And you can imagine the maintenance costs here. And thankfully, we, uh, there is an endowment, as well as a very active volunteer group that um, raises money for the garden. And the adorable Thatch Cottage, which was the children's playhouse. And I, I particularly like this, um, this vignette, if you will, because there's, there's a so-called cottage garden just outside the Thatch, Thatch Cottage. And I've always been fascinated by cottage gardens and how it's, 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 a, it's a relaxed mixture of different, uh, different flowers and plant material. And you can note the layering from um, the, the lower perennials on up to the, to the very tall helianthus. Across the street is our second house we're going to look at this evening, Hercules, which is privately owned by the Howard Grace family. It was actually built much later, and, and I've tr I'm trying to go chronologically, but in this case, I'm, I'm stepping outside that, that soft rule because the house is so close to Old Westbury Gardens and also was built by the brother of John Phipps. Howard Phipps um, bought a cottage on this property and over time began to accumulate acreage. When he met his, his bride-to-be, Harriet Dyer Price, he commissioned an architect to draw plans for, for a main house that was inspired, Ericlis, that was a name that was inspired by a castle in Scotland. But after the wedding and after house construction began, the new wife was not so keen on living in a castle, a Scottish castle on the north coast, uh, north shore of Long Island. So she halted construction. She was from Virginia and she wanted a, a more uh, Georgian type of house. So they changed architects and, and changed the style of the house. So today this is considered a classical Georgian and, and I love this description with a hint of American art deco. This is the rear of the property with a, a um, um, 
uh, a swimming pool that's not a rectilinear, not a rectangle, but it actually follows the landscape. And this whole notion of looking out the center of the door and looking out at the landscape beyond, and it, it, it spreads out like a sundial. And if you note above the back door, there is in fact a sundial. So this is reflected, the sundial shape is reflected in, in the landscape in a three-dimensional way. The front entrance is very formal, lovely. Um, you come around a bend and you, you begin to see the unfolding of the plant material. In the back is a sunken garden with a swimming pool, a utilitarian, well, not, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely pool that can be used as a swimming pool. But to me, I, I'm, I like it so much because it looks like a reflecting pool, much more so than a utilitarian swimming pool, which um, Phipps has had children and, and, and uh, our hot Long Island summers, of course we need a swimming pool. And adjacent to that are these two adorable um, um, Asian shaped cottages, which serve as changing rooms to not only the swimming pool, but also the tennis court behind. With a very classically inspired um, uh, fountain with the two koi fish as, as fountain heads spitting into the water. And scattered throughout the property are these lovely pieces of, of, um, uh, of subtle sculpture which catches your eye as you're moving from one level to another. Mr. Phipps um, was a ardent horticulturalist. And in fact, he was, he was such a um, successful, uh, or, or he was such a, a studied horticulturalist that he was a member of the Rhododendron Society. And they proudly presented to him in, in 1978, the bronze medal for his outstanding achievement in hybridizing rhododendron. And for many of you who've been to some of the sales at Old Westbury Gardens, there are often really unusual rhododendron that can be bought um, in small sizes. And, and today I was um, out and about and I saw a yellow rhododendron, which you rarely see, but that's the type of plant material that you can get at Old Westbury Gardens. And then, the house is connected to the stables beyond by this really in, in uh, for Long Island, such a, such a, a wonderful concept of having a field between the house and the, the stables um, with lots of open space. Eagle's Nest is right around in the backyard of the Heckscher Museum. This is, this is a, a, a really charming Gold Coast estate that today is a museum for the county of Suffolk. One would think you're in Spain because it's got a, a it's got a an entryway that you enter as if you're in a um, somewhat protected uh, fortress, and then it opens up into this courtyard. The house was begun in 1910, but wasn't finished until 1936, and it went through many different changes. The owner was William K. Vanderbilt, who was um, who had the original house designed by actually his cousin, Whitney Warren of the architectural firm Warren and Wetmore. And um, um, one, of, one of the Grand Central stations in New York was also designed by Warren and Wetmore. There were, there were Grand Central Depot, Grand Central Station, and one, one more, but there's been many iterations of Grand Central. And the same architect who did Willie K. Vanderbilt's house was the architect for Grand Central. And this is an idea of how the house grew over time, almost an organic creation with a two, um, two story structures on either side and then connected by a covered passageway. With a, with a view of Long Island Sound and through a porthole like door, uh, William K. Vanderbilt was an avid yachtsman he, this, this, um, how his, the house he built was on 43 acres um, and it had a power plant. He, he, he also had seaplanes, which he used, he, he had a pilot who had an apartment at uh, Eagle's Nest and he used the seaplanes to get William, um, Willie K. Vanderbilt back and forth um, to his summer homes and, and, and work. 
a Moroccan style garden. And, and there's, there's a little bit of everything at uh, Eagle's Nest, this, this Moroccan style in, um, fountain in an enclosed courtyard with, with Italian putti on the left. And there's another sundial. We saw that at Erklis. And here's another sundial, a, a very large one, completely covering the entire wall. And this is a side entrance to um, um, Eagle's Nest. And when I was traveling in Portugal, I'm always looking, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I'm always looking at details and looking at gardens and whatnot. It's kind of how I, I travel. And I found at the uh, um, Chateau Matus, and <clears throat> excuse me, so many of you may have drunk a little bit of Matus in your, in your youth. It was that the, the wine very popular, um, well, when I was in college, but <clears throat> never mind. Um, I, I think we've improved the quality of the wine we drink today. But I was really struck by the similarity between Eagle's Nest and this villa in, in um, Portugal, in Porto, Portugal. Some of the details that, that I find fascinating are is this embedded pebble mosaic. And on the right is one section showing a um, acorn, which was a the symbol of the Vanderbilt family. Some people say, or, or the legend goes, that these are columns that came from the ancient city of Carthage that was burned down. I'm not so sure about that. I'm not going to um, uh, make an argument, but I love the placement of them just so, and this is as you drive in the entrance to Eagle's Nest. And it reminds me of Hadrian's Villa, which is the um, uh, villa, the ancient Roman villa outside of Rome. And this whole notion of columns decorating a space. Now at, at Eagle's Nest, the columns have been um, placed um, to greet the visitor as one comes in, but it's this, this, this idea of a, um, columns that signify a space um, which is the columns are highly permeable. It's not really a building, but it's an enclosed area. These are eagles that were brought to Eagle's Nest, hence its name, from Grand Central Depot when it was, that was the first iteration of Grand Central. And they, they looked rather out of place, out of scale, and they, they are at the very entrance to the property but they certainly do make a statement. The Vanderbilts owned Grand Central Station and the railroads that went in and out from Grand Central Station. So it's a symbol, not only um, of, of power, but also the family's power. And that's William K. Vanderbilt himself, um, very uh, self-possessed man, I would say, and just had so many interests. interests. One, of them, one of which was the Hall of Fishes, which is really a mini museum. And in the middle of it, there's a bust of William K. Vanderbilt. But he went around the world um, on his yacht collecting different artifacts and, and, and uh, crustaceans from his travels. It was a, a, a really important part of his life. And he, um, he also did some underwater um, exploration. Um, our next house, <laughs> and wait till you see this house if you haven't visited, Ohika Castle is, is quite close um, to uh, Eagle's Nest in Huntington. And this is what it looks like today. This was built originally on over 400 acres by Otto Herman Kahn, who um, uh, made a series of land acquisitions to create this very large estate. And in addition to that, he spent, or he had his contractors spending two years hauling soil up, the, up this slope. He found a, a, a high slope, but it wasn't high enough. He wanted it to be as high as Clarence Mackey's house in Roslyn. And Clarence Mackey was another owner of a Gold Coast estate called Harbor Hill. Uh, Khan reportedly had three architectural firms draw plans, and one of them, Delano and Aldrich, 
emulated the style of Harbor Hill and hence they were hired. And this is what the house looks like today. A lack of applied orna ornamentation. But if you look at it, you'll see in, in the upper right is um, Chateau Fontainebleau in France. And you can see this whole notion of how French classical architecture was brought um, in, in the minds and eyes of the architects and then, then used as stylistically as the houses were built in this area. And, and since so many of the, the new wealthy owners, Otto Kahn included, wanted to impress, they, they wanted to show their neighbors that they not only had culture, knew who to hire, and um, also had, had this notion of, of European influence on not only their houses, but, but also their activities. There's an 18 hole golf course or was uh, formal gardens, horse stables. And I took this photograph visiting it. it uh, I was really happy to get a, a lovely tour at Ohika Castle several years ago. And I took this, it was in the winter of course, and shows the very um, strong outlines, the symmetry, the rectilinear shape with a circle in the middle um, of this typical type of sunken terrace. The, this was completely redone by the present owner. Rid, um, after Otto Harman Kahn and his wife died, it became actually a, 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 a summer getaway for New York City sanitation workers. And then it became a military school. And then it was left in disrepair. But lucky for us, it was purchased in the early 200s by um, one man who has made Ohiga Castle his life. And you can rent rooms there um, if you want to spend the night. It's also a site for wedding events and whatnot. This is a pool. What a, what a lovely place to swim. Um, clearly it's not used that much today, um, but just a small lap pool that was uh, used by the owners indoor with fountains on either side and classical statues all looking out. And this looks out onto a very wide open space that was the golf course. The studio is a private house as is Erkless. The other houses we've looked at are open to the public. The studio is a private house that was created for Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney in approximately 1916. And Delano and Aldrich were also the architects and they were told by Mrs. Whitney who was rich in her own right and then married an, into another rich family. She was told, um, she told the architects that price was no object. And in fact, that's, that's how this house presents itself. It's a, it's meant to look like a Italian garden casino. Uh, and a casino is not a, um, a building that you live in uh, as a residence, but it's um, a place where you go visit. It's meant to be a, a, a quite grand summer building. And that's what the studio looks like. But in fact, and hence its name, in fact, uh, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, the founder of the Whitney Museum was herself a sculptress, sculptor and used this room as her sculpture studio. Today, it's a, it's a living room, dining room. But if you look over on the right-hand side, underneath the dining room table is a trap door that would lift her very large sculptures, sculptors, sculptures into a passageway below and a horse and cart then carried the, the um, molds out to uh, where they would be created into her final statues. This is, she had many artistic friends. Um, the uh, uh, um, Howard Cushing created this mural and he actually incorporated, and that's um, incorporated Mrs. Whitney into the mural as in kind of a, not a fictitious costume because she had that costume that she wore to a, to a, um, um, costume ball and incorporated a view of her, a, a similar view of her in that dress. 
around the property are scattered fountains and statues. And then in the back is one of my all time favorite gardens. It's just, it's got everything. It's got interest, the water, the fountain and the lower right of the screen, which then moves through the rill, which is like a, a water channel into the swimming pool. The, this is the three fountain, the three graces looking at the house. And this helps emphasize the really strong central access, not only of the house, but the garden, the, that access um, starts behind where this photograph was taken, then goes through the center of the house and then out to the other side of the property. And this, this is so one of the charming elements of this property. This is a sarcophagus, which uh, the owner covered with um, asphaltic paper and then at, sometimes had, had pots on top. Um, she was an ardent gardener and was all, always planting seedlings. And I just, I love this view. This is an existing, this was built as part of the original um, uh, studio. And then when it became a full-time residence for the family, um, it, they converted some of the outdoor buildings into useful um, gardening areas. Now, sadly, um, I, I learned a couple of months ago that this house is on the market. It has remained in the Vanderbilt family from the very beginning, but as, as time goes on, it gets more and more expensive to maintain these houses. And um, it's just, uh, 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 they, this, this is a, a relic of the past, but oh, what a relic it is. And um, became a, a, just a lovely, well-visited family home. And I hope many of you have visited it because the owners are very generous and, and would host benefits and, um, at the studio and, and loved having people see their great house. Planting Fields is, a, is now an arboretum in Oyster Bay, New York. It was built by William Coe, who was, who was a self-made man. And then he married quite well. He married May Rogers and together they built planting fields, which the original building, the original residence, which they first rented burned down. And then they built a new building. The architect was Grosvenor, Grosvenor Atterbury and added gardens, gardens, a lot of gardens. Uh, this is the so-called blue pool garden or the uh, Italian garden. And it's lined as you can see with um, blue tiles with two fountains in the middle. And at the end is this very sweet thatch cottage. It might remind you of the, uh, excuse me, this is not thatch, but the shape might remind you of the thatch cottage at um, Old Westbury Gardens. And inside are, is a design is an interior that was designed by Elsie DeWolf, the famous decorator of the early part of the 20th century, with murals by uh, Chandler on on the walls. This is May Coe's bedroom. It actually wasn't the this was not the original design, but um, the the murals were taken down at some point, and the in the past uh, 15 years. Um, the executive director found a muralist who could capture the idea of what had been there through photographs. And I think that the artist really succeeded. If you look on the right hand side, you see this great expanse of bay windows and those bay windows look out on the blue pool or the Italian garden. And just because Americans like to have it all, the house itself is predominantly a Tudor revival house. And yet here we have a very Italian, a Italian Renaissance type of open loggia. And it's, it's attached to the house. And, and um, I don't know, you might say, well, it's, it's a little out of place, but I always find that this is the charm of American, um, of, uh, American architecture. There's, there's not this strict and, and really snobbish attitude that you have to have one type of architecture. It's not a purist. I mean, of course, of course, we have those who 
want it um, just exactly by the book, but I, but I like how this Italian loggia is added on. And just recently, just the, the scaffolding came down, um, this was uh, leaking, like, leaking like a sieve and it was completely redone. Other aspects of planting fields is this, this glorious rose arch. Many weddings um, take place at planting fields. And the Camellia House, which in February is, is one of the best, well, it's not a secret, but, but um, it's just a wonderful respite in, in the, the, that bleak month of February to come in. And that's when the Camellias are fully in bloom and uh, um, several activities and the gardens are, and the in, uh, uh, greenhouses are open. So we finished with, I've finished with six, six houses we visited and, and um, I, I did kind of condense this talk a little bit cause I, I didn't want to run over the time, but I can't help but leave, um, leave you this evening without talking about Beatrice Farron. And many of the um, houses we looked at were designed, um, the gardens were designed by Olmsted brothers. And Beatrice Farron was a, a the first founding female member of the American Society of Landscape Architects and highly regarded um, in the US. She did many designs on Long Island, but sadly, none of them exist. This is one, this is a plan, uh, excuse me, a bird's eye view of one of her gardens. And you can see all those elements of, of an Italianate garden with the reflecting pool and the matching, two matching buildings at the far end. Now we're we're coming back to Ohika Castle for a minute. You recognize the formal garden, which we saw outlined in snow um, about the middle of the frame. The, the Mrs. Uh, Khan wanted more intimate gardens, so she hired Beatrice Farron to do 159 drawings and create various gardens. Um, such as the Dutch garden, the pool garden, the octagon garden. And you, you can see the smaller rooms that, um, that she designed. And this was, this was really Mrs. Kahn's, Mrs. Kahn's gardens, whereas um, uh, Mr. Kahn uh, reveled in his very formal, almost, almost Versailles-like garden, which was the, the upper garden was designed by the Olmsted brothers. And since there are so few uh, Beatrice Farron Gardens, I'm going to leave you this evening, uh, at Beatrice Farron Gardens on Long Island, I'm going to leave you this e evening with a view of one of her best known and best maintained gardens in Washington. So if you, if you are in the Washington area, I can, I highly recommend visiting this garden. The owners left an endowment, so the maintenance is, is uh, excellent. And there's, again, we see this, this same theme, this idea of a reflecting pool here. The shape's a little different, the sides are curved, but nonetheless, it's got the, the um, et cetera's at either end of the pool. Um, and with that, I thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Cece. This was such a wonderful discussion and presentation. And um, we're just going to take a couple minutes to answer some of our questions from our viewers. Um, so the first question for you is, do you know if the Whitney studio is open now on a regular basis to visit? Uh, no, it's not. It's actually being shown by the real estate agent. So um, no. Um, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's been sure. open many <laughs> available to the public many times, but I am not at the moment. Um, going back to the beginning of the presentation um, and F. Scott Fitzgerald, would he have visited any of these Gold Coast mansions? Do we yes, know? absolutely. Um, he, I, I, he was, and I kind of skipped over that uh, way too fast. And thank you for asking that question. Yes, he, he and Zelda, his wife, were very much part of the s social life and they were, they were fun to have around. Zelda was, was uh, uh, full of life and he was interesting and creative. And um, so they would be part of the social circuit and they did visit these houses. I don't have an exact list in which they, they visited these houses, but so much so that he understood 
the, the society as well as the architecture. Um, one more question is, um, where did these uh, landscape architects and architects source their plant material from? Would it have been the US or abroad? Thank you again for that question, because I, I wanted to mention that Hicks Nursery, which is still going in Westbury, was founded in 1897. Um, they supplied m many of these estates. And um, I, I suspect knowing William Coe, um, who was born in England, I suspect he, he um, imported some of his camellias. From England, I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but um, he was an Anglophile, so it would make sense. But typically, the plant material, material came locally, and, and Hicks Nursery was one of the suppliers. Um, so let's see. Um, you mentioned that Ohika Castle, the gardens are are quite different than they were um, originally. So today, they don't appear the same. Are there any gardens that do appear quite similar to when they were originally designed of the ones you showed? I would say of all of them, of the six, uh, Old Westbury Gardens has kept its lines the most. Um, and I, I'm gonna put in a, a little PR plug for planting fields because I'm a, a trustee as, as Caitlin mentioned. And um, we are working very hard, and that is also an Olmsted landscape. We're working very hard at looking closely at the drawings. And as we uh, work on certain areas, we try to um, um, be, uh, be true to the original um, designs. So to answer the question, Old Westbury Gardens is just a wonderful example, uh, but don't, don't miss planting fields. <laughs> um, another question is, I might, I might say this wrong, so correct me if I mispronounce it. Um, what was the mute on and where was it again? Oh, thank you. I, sadly, I um, eliminated Mudan from the, the slideshow tonight. Um, it's, it's no, it no longer exists. It's located in Laddingtown, New York and it was a, almost a village unto itself. So apologies for that. I could have le at least shown one slide. And it's one of my favorites because I, I live nearby and I used to take walks frequently in the area. And I, I, I buy my eggs from the farmer who, who um, literally um, is on the property where, where the chicken, chickens um, uh, were housed. So mutant, um, is, is, is no longer existing. There are bits and pieces of it that you can see. It's, it's nestled between the Creek Club and let's see, uh, and, and uh, Glen Cove. Um, I think our last question is, um, was Long Island, Long Island's Gold Coast unique in its like architecture and the community that developed there? Were there other places in the United States that were similar to the Gold Coast? Maybe I'm biased, but I'm saying that Long Island did it the biggest and the bestest. There are areas that I've visited, St. Louis, for instance, which has ravishing how uh, just beautiful houses from the same period. But there's not quite the, the vastness. Uh, and Chicago's another city, um, definitely. And, and Pittsburgh, and um, I could go on. Um, but there's something about this area because um, it was so close to, to New York and easy to reach where the owners would build these um, houses, not their main residence, but the houses that they'd come visit. So. Um, I would say Long Island is pretty unique. And as you drive around, you'll, you'll begin to notice that some of these houses are really substantial. And by the way, the houses are, uh, are um, uh, in addition to museums and private houses, there are also convents and schools um, and, and, being, and, and retirement homes being utilized in different ways. But but they're everywhere. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just stick with my slightly subjective 
point of view and say that the, the vastness of these houses are um, unique to Long Island. Oh, prob uh, Boston, I can't think, I, I should have mentioned Boston. There's tons of houses. Somebody mentioned houses. Uh, Rhode Island. Prob uh, yeah. New oh, Newport, thank you, that too. I will say Long Island is unique since we're all from here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cece, for this uh, presentation and for joining us this evening. Thank you everyone for attending and giving us your attention. Um, just to wrap things up, as a reminder, Art in Bloom will be on view at the museum June 12th and June 13th. And we encourage you to visit. Um, there will be 12 floral arrangements that the participating designers from North Country, North Suffolk, South Side, and Three Harbors Garden Clubs um, will be creating inspired by work of art in the exhibition, The Heckscher Museum Celebrates 100, which is our centennial exhibition, so that's quite exciting. Um, please visit heckscher.org for more information on how to schedule your visit to come to Art and Bloom and to register for the other two lectures in our um, virtual Art and Bloom series following this one. Thank you, everyone. Stay well. Thank you. Have a good evening.